uh, we are moving to this section number three, exploring digital heritage. Um, and <clears throat> we have uh, several uh, presenters uh, for today. Um, and I will chair this, uh, this session. Uh, my name is Ndezhda Pavreznik. I'm chair uh, of the Center for Digital Humanities um, and associate professor at the Department of Interdisciplinary Historical Research of Perm State University. Um, I think that um, I can't recognize uh, several participants from the list. Um, so probably we can move um, to that presentations uh, that I can recognize. So um, can I check, uh, do we have um, people from uh, Taiwan? who will uh, talk about uh, the geospatial information technology. Do we have someone? Um, no. Uh, I think that we, we can um, just be back with this uh, talk. Um, OK, uh, the, the next one uh, is about um, to be uh, presented by uh, Eleftheria Sarnastosovitis. Uh, and he will arrive soon, I think. The previous session was uh, a bit messy due to technical reason, uh, and may uh, we have to cope with that some way, so we can just uh, change a little bit uh, the um, order uh, of uh, our presenters. Um, so uh, let's move to the third presentation. Uh, and uh, I think that... Uh, um, Leteris uh, will return us soon. So um, I would like to give the floor to Georgiou Georgia, um, who produced her uh, presentation and paper uh, along with uh, her colleagues uh, from the Center for Research and Technology, Hellas, Thessaloniki, Greece. Uh, and the presentation uh, is exploring the potentials of virtual museology the case of the Virtual Museum, Museum of Anastasis, uh, 1821. So, Georgia, the floor is yours. Um, I'm here. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yeah, very well. Great to have uh, you. Okay. Okay. I'm Georgia Georgiou. It's my name. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you for letting us be part of that conference. Congratulations for the organization. I will now make a search screen, okay? Um, so uh, in this presentation, I will introduce you to the Virtual Museum Epanastasis 1821. I will introduce myself, I'm Georgia Georgiou. I'm an archaeologist, museologist, and research assistant. I'm the Multimedia Knowledge Social Media Analytics Laboratory of the Information Technology Institute of the Center for Research and Technology, LAS. CERT is one of the leading research centers in Greece. It has a personnel over 700 people and works in a variety of disciplines. And, uh, and with uh, a number of distinctions and awards in the international level. Yeah. Our project is the Panastasis 2021, communication and promotion of the revival of historical events of the revolution through virtual reality 1821. It's founded uh, by the Hellenic Foundation for Research and Innovation. This is a institution under the Greek Ministry of Investments and Development within the framework of the first gold science society 200 years since the Greek revolution. And as you can easily imagine from the title of the call, our project is related to the outbreak of the Greek revolution war against the Ottomans that uh, happened during the 19th century. Uh, our team consists of four people, Dr. Ioannis Kobatsiaris, Dr. Spiros Nikolopoulos, Eleftheris Ansovitis, you met him before, and me. It is a project that is still in progress. It will be uh, finalized and accessible by the general public by March, 2022. 
So what we actually do, we wanted to create a virtual museum that combines the technologies of virtual reality and serious games. And we wanted to exploit these potentials and exploit the technologies to the fullest possible extent. Virtual reality offers, first and foremost, offers accessibility. That means that everyone from his own space can access a virtual museum and in his own time and uh, that uh, regarding uh, the current coronavirus time and uh, regarding reports that showed that 90% uh, of museums forced to close during the first months of COVID outbreak and, and regarding also many reports that saw museum uh, um, shifted towards uh, to reconsidering their digital transformation, I think virtual reality will play a vital role in the digital transformation of cultural heritage of the future. So apart from that, uh, virtual museum environment uh, offers the ability to concentrate, to uh, collect and exhibit a variety of exhibits that are uh, selected from various resources. And uh, yeah, that gives the designer uh, freedom and flexibility to apply his creativity in the design phase. And uh, also uh, in uh, accompanying with uh, serious games technologies, uh, the designer can uh, create personalized experiences that aligns with one of the utmost concerns of modern museology, that is how to offer the users, the visitors, a chance to get involved personally in the museum experience, uh, to get involved emotionally and in more engaging experiences. So we wanted to exploit all these potentials and we use the technologies of virtual reality and of serious games and in order to create our 3D models, the 3D character animations, the virtual environment and full immersive experiences. And uh, uh, we use Oculus Rift S head-mounted display accompanied with touch controllers in order to secure a full uh, and a high level of immersion of the player into the virtual environment. So what we do actually, we create a museum, a museum that narrates the story of the Greek revolution, uh, highlight aspects and personalities of the nation's revolution through the exhibition of a variety of digitized archival material, mainly maps and pieces of art like paintings. This will be accessible by the general public and aims through the use of virtual reality series games to enhance the user experience and thus to create a more effective understanding on the impact these events, the, these historical events had on people and the evolution of the Greek state. In order to achieve this goal, uh, we implemented a strategy that is based on three goals. We wanted the user, the visitor, to learn about the war and the the history of the war, to experience a historical environment and to act as a historical figure himself. The first goal, the learning goal. Uh, to support this goal, uh, we implemented an exhibition design uh, that uh, co uh, consists of seven exhibition units. It covers a period of nine years, this historical period, and we uh, collaborated with 12 institutions all over Greece that provide us with access to their collections and to their digital data in order to take the exhibits from that uh, institutions, uh, including galleries, libraries, museums, and archives. The second goal, uh, goal is the uh, experiment goal. We want uh, the uh, user to experience uh, the museum. And we wanted first, uh, the, this goal is a multi-leveled goal. We wanted the user to experience the architecture of the period. Uh, for that reason, we chose a building, historical building of the 18th century, that it is related to the history of the war. We 3D model it and uh, we uh, use it, we convert it into our uh, museum virtual uh, space. 
So when someone enters the museum, he gets a feeling of entering a historical building of that period. In this picture, you can see how on the below picture, how it is the building now and how we uh, 3D model it in, the, in order to be used as a museum. And the second level of experience to experience this, the inside, this pattern design. Uh, so we transform the inside space in order to be to host uh, the exhibition material, and we wanted the user to experience the spatial design as well. That reflects the philosophy of the whole exhibition. Each unit has its own exhibition plan, and that uh, inside space was used is a, a two-floor space. It was used as the exhibition space. We have a collection of uh, material, uh, of artifacts uh, that we took from the collaborating uh, institutions and uh, they are exhibited in the, in the inside space. And come at night uh, with the uh, interpretation material, meaning the exhibition texts that are offered in two languages, Greek and English. And uh, the user can either uh, read or listen to this material by and triggering the option, the available option. But the second level of experience is uh, we wanted uh, the user, the visitor, to experience the artifacts in their uh, historical environment. The user has two options, either to experience selected artifacts in the exhibition space, and that means he can interact with them in the exhibition space by uh, grabbing some of them and observe them uh, more closely to his eyes. And the second level of experience they exhibit in is uh, by experience them in their historical environment. How we did that? In the video, you can see a user who is uh, fully immersed in a uh, uh, reconstructed uh, historical environment that is the captain's cabin, a cabin, an office of a captain of a ship of that period. So we reconstructed the cabin and we uh, put inside the cabin exhibits that are related to the novel history of the war. So the user enters the cabin he can observe the whole cabin in detail and interact with exhibits in that environment. He can bring closer to his eyes some exhibits, archives, for example, something that you, you can never do in a physical museum. You can never grab an archive and read it more closely to your eyes. You can convert something in order to see it from both sides, or you can, bring, you can take an archive and uh, read what it is written under the light of a lamp inside the cabin. So uh, this is how we interact with exhibits in their historical environment. And the last goal was the act call. We wanted the visitor to be an active visitor of the virtual museum. So in order to do that, we invite the visitors to uh, be engaged in full immersive games. We took paintings and we revived them in the virtual environment. In that, big, in that slide, you can see on the left a very renowned painting of the painter Nikiforos Litras. Uh, this painting is titled The Burning of the Turkish Flagship by Costadinos Canaris. Costadinos Canaris was a captain. And the painting reflects uh, to a very uh, important historical event uh, that happened during the second uh, year of the war. Actually, the captain himself, we know that the captain himself narrated the story to the painter in order to draw this painting. So we, we exhibit this painting and by triggering the artifacts, the uh, user is transferred in the historical environment of that event. And he has to be the protagonist of the story himself. He has to accomplish mission and be the captain who sets the ship on fire. 
so it is actually a game. Uh, all in all, the whole uh, philosophy of our virtual museum is, can be summarized uh, in the following text that it is uh, exhibited in the introductory unit when someone enters the museum. Uh, he can read the, uh, the following. Welcome to the Virtual Museum of Anastasis 1821. Don't hesitate, don't be afraid. Learn, experience, act. The revolution is also yours. Thank you very, very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Georgia, for this fantastic presentation. And this project is just something really great. And I would like to try to try <laughs> playing with this um, be virtual museum. Um, do we have any questions from the audience? We, we have time and we can very, very, uh, we can be very, very relaxed, I think, <laughs> in terms of schedule a bit. Okay, we have a, a, a question from Sally. Sally? Thanks very much, Georgia, for the uh, presentation. Fantastic. Fantastic. Um, I, you said you've been collaborating with 12 museums, archives and libraries, and I wondered, um, particularly the museums, do you, uh, sorry, particularly the smaller institutions, um, do you um, sort of train? How easy is it for them to have these virtual reality sets within their museum context? And do you, as the project, sort of help, help them with this a little bit? Uh, well, we collaborated in a level of letting us having access to their material. So in the next level, we will choose some of these institutions in order to install this application in their museums. I guess we will have a, a, a period of training how to use, but it's very easy. It's something that you get very easily. But in this level, we just had uh, access to their collections and to their digital uh, material in order to take this uh, material that it's just uh, photos of high level photos, not something extraordinary, in order to put the, this material inside the museum. Great, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Um, I have actually the question, uh, which is um, a bit maybe confusing um, for me. Uh, I, I'd like to imagine how it works. So um, there is should be a sort of uh, interface uh, to control uh, all the uh, virtual museum and all the processes. So the question is um, how it's easy. It's not the question. Uh, it's just uh, the opportunity for training. But um, do you provide a, any sort of individual trajectories for different audiences to move through the digital content? For instance, can I choose, I would like to do this and that, or I should move through the very beginning till the most complicated something, how it works. No, I, I, I didn't really uh, understand the question. I think you have to tell me if we have an assistance of how to use the museum to give any assistance of how to, uh, to someone who want to use the museum. Did I understand well? Uh, I mean, the virtual museum environment you created so, yes. um, yeah, uh, if you uh, enter this uh, virtual environment uh, to move through the digital content you prepared, so is it an only oh. one environment for this one scenario to follow, or you have uh, different versions according to uh, the age of audience or uh, our own um, preferences uh, to get acquainted with the materials? Yes, I understand. Well, actually, it's like uh, uh, having a tour inside the physical museum. So you, uh, when you enter the museum, it's a two floor exhibition space. So you have to follow a little bit the museum curator, the exhibition idea, the philosophy in order to have a, an overlook of the story and how that it's narrated in the exhibition space. So you begin with the introductory unit and you go to the pre-revolution years, you see the exhibits that are related and the interpretation material, and then you move forward to the next units. 
So uh, you have some stops in order to see specific uh, artifacts that you can uh, interact with them or trigger experiences that take you to the other level of the gaming level. Did I answer your question? Yeah, thank you. It's more clear, uh, just more technical rather than some deep ideas. Um, uh, um, any other questions, comments? Sally, is it just uh, still, um, do you want? No, it's just the previous one. Okay. No, 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 I didn't want to, if anybody else has got a question, but I have another question if there's still space. Yes, please, sure. Brilliant. Thank you very much. I, I just, um, I loved your, um, I don't know what, your diagram with learn, experience and act. I, I, I love this. And I just wondered in, to what extent have you done some work on, are you targeting, because I can imagine that if you're targeting different age groups or different people with different levels of digital literacy. So I just wondered, are you doing different things for different groups or do you have a particular target audience that you would like with each of these three actions if that made any sense uh, no, no first and foremost i have we have to take into consideration that it's something that cannot be used by children under the age of 10 12 they cannot use the head mounted display it's forbidden for them. So we are uh, targeting the whatever age group it's I, from uh, 12 years old and older. Um, uh, but uh, all the experiences are targeted for all people. We don't have uh, different levels of uh, difficulty or of um, um, uh, of uh, meaning of the exhibition to be targeted to different groups. Uh, it is, we wanted uh, to be, uh, as someone who visits a physical museum, he enters a, a space, he sees exhibits, and he may or may not take part in the, um, in the full immersive experiences. But the mission is not very difficult. It's something that can easily uh, do and have not many levels of difficulty, just one or two missions in each game. Brilliant, that's very clear. Thank you. Thank you so much, Georgia. It's just something great and I would like to play with it. Um, <laughs> unfortunately, we have no time for other questions, but thank you so much. Uh, and uh, thank you very much uh, too. We are moving to the next presentation. Uh, Sally Chambers, uh, who is a librarian in the Royal Library of Belgium, and also she's a PhD mm -hmm. student, yeah. Um, of the um, Hand Center for Digital Humanities uh, at Ghent University. Uh, and Sally will uh, present, uh, her, um, present uh, her talk together with Frédéric Lemers from uh, Royal Library of Belgium. And the talk will be devoted to experimenting uh, with collection as data, exploring sustainable workflows to facilitate corpus building in the digital humanities. Sally, the floor is yours. Thanks very much indeed, Nadezhda. And uh, can you see everything okay? Is that all Seems right? Fine. It's perfect. Thank Brilliant. You. And indeed, my co colleague, he's just been actually called to another meeting. Unfortunately, he's one of the directors. Uh, he's the head of um, the digitization department. Frederick Lemmers um, is the head of digitization at the Royal Library of Belgium. And he's just unfortunately called to a management meeting, so he couldn't attend just now. So he sends his apologies, um, but we work on this project together. So um, I don't know um, how many of you have come across this collections as data initiative. Um, this was originally um, developed in the United States um, by people, so as uh, Thomas Padilla, and they've actually had two projects, um, one called the first phase, always already computational collections as data, which focused more on the kind of methodological aspects of, of collections as data, and then a second one, collections as data, part to whole, which was based more on the actual implementation. But collections as data in general means um, curators of libraries, museums and archives 
how can we think differently about providing access um, to our collections as a data form? And I will go into that in a little bit more detail, um, particularly for things like digital humanities research. And some of you may have also um, heard of the FAIR data movement. That means findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable data. I think this is quite a European concept, but I think this is something also that relates to collections as data. So what does this mean? So what, how we've um, termed it at the Royal Library of Belgium is data level access. So here on the screen, you can probably just about see, um, this is a representation of a digitized newspaper. And what we wanted to do in the collections as data movement is provide access to these underlying files as it, as it were the sort of internal workings of a digital library so that people can use um, these da data files for analysis using various different tools and methods from the digital humanities. So um, at the moment, um, as I was saying, Collections as Data is quite a US, a United States centered project in North America. And we wanted to try to bring it um, more east um, towards Europe. So we put in a project proposal at the Royal Library to our funding agency, the, the BELSPO, that's the Belgian Science Policy Office, to um, tr test out um, Collections as Data in the Belgian Royal Library. So basically, um, here at the top of the screen, Belgica Press, this is our um, portal for digitized newspapers. And in there, you can do full text search of over 100 different newspaper titles um, from Belgium in both um, French, uh, Dutch uh, and German. Um, and then you can search them um, full text. But what we want to do is really say, OK, these are all the different files. You can see XML Alto files here. You can see PDFs of the pages. And you've also got the original um, image files uh, in TIFF format. So we wanted to see how we could provide access to this underlying data, which makes it a lot easier for digital humanities research. So we didn't want to do this in a vacuum. So we wanted to think, OK, um, what would digital humanities researchers actually need and to work and collaborate together with digital humanities researchers? So we have three what we're calling interdisciplinary research scenarios, one uh, on from history, one from um, literary studies and one from media studies. And here, um, also in the library, some of you may have known of these labs initiatives. Um, at KBR, we have a, a lab called the Digital Research Lab. And the goal of that um, lab is to facilitate text and data mining on the digitized and born digital. So I think Valerie this morning mentioned you've got the digitized newspapers, for example. And in the future, we also want to work with the born digital collections, such as the web archives and social media archives as well. So to give you a little bit more uh, introduction to um, our um, research scenario. So the first one is led by the Ghent Center for Digital Humanities, which is where I work half time. Um, and this is the discipline of social history. And we're interested in the interbellum period um, from World War I to the end of World War II. And we're looking at tracing what we call collective action. So that is, for example, if people went on strike, if they did demonstrations, we want to examine how these were reported in the um, newspapers. The second one um, is from uh, literary studies um, that is led jointly now by the University of Antwerp in Belgium and the University of Boras in uh, Sweden, because one of the Belgian researchers has just got a professorship there. And um, this is literary studies. It's about 1830 to 1930, so the first 100 years of the Belgian nation. And there's something called literary supplements here called feuilletons. 
um, at the bottom uh, of the screen. And this is where um, literary publications such as um, in novels were first appeared in the newspapers and were published there. And finally, the third scenario we're working with is from media history. And this is particularly looking at um, Belgian journalism. So they're interested in this project to create a database of Belgian journalists. They've already got a list of Belgian journalists and they want to see, can they mine the information in the digitized newspapers to find hidden um, journalists? And they also want to look at how the discourses of um, uh, journalism played out across the different newspapers with difficult, different political standpoints. So um, as in the title of my talk, we were talking about corpus building. So if you imagine we've got this digitized newspaper portal, and then we have these three research scenarios, which of those different newspapers would we want to include? So we had some workshops and the idea was, yes, it's a bit of a chicken and egg. Um, if you have a research scenario, for example, on the literary studies, which newspapers do you join, uh, do you use? So you have to see which ones have got these literary supplements in, but are they digitized for the right years? And um, this, um, these researchers at the bottom, I don't know if you can see the link, um, these um, Gustavo Candela and his colleagues from the University of Alicante, they took the collections as idea, data idea and tried to implement it how you do that in practice, a data workflow. And we're going to see, we're in the process of checking now whether that data workflow that they proposed would work for the Royal Library of Belgium. So I wanted to just go into a little bit more detail. So if we take the Ghent University case study of, for example, strikes in newspapers. So firstly, um, what we did was, and it's interesting, um, the easiest way to find out when the general strikes in Belgium were to look on Wikipedia. And here is the English language Wikipedia page, and you can see all of the different years that strikes were happening, these general strikes were happening in Belgium. And we thought this is a nice idea to give us a way of which newspaper titles to select for our corpus. Then we had to look at which of those newspapers were digitized. So here, when we were thinking about corpus building, we wanted to have a balance between the Dutch language and the French language that was important as well. And we wanted to have a balance between, for example, socialist newspapers or more liberal newspapers as well. So we wanted to have a nice balanced corpus and we wanted to be clear how we'd put that corpus together. Then along the top, I don't know if you can see, these are all the years of the strikes. And we found that 1913, this green line in the middle, this was very good. This happened to be the year of um, the World Fair, which took place in Ghent as well, um, where there were a lot of demonstrations around. So the, historically, that was a very interesting year. And that was also digitized. So it made it very nice um, for our corpus. Um, what we also found is that um, I'm not an historian, I'm literary studies, but um, we, did, we needed to know information about the historical context of the newspaper. So here you can see Voorhout, this is one of the Dutch language um, socialist newspapers. Um, it says socialist newspaper in the title. So we could probably um, guess that it was a socialist newspaper, but it, one of the information is um, how can we find out more about the historical context? Because that isn't in the digital library system. So our newspaper curators started to make little historical contextual um, uh, paragraphs with more information about the newspaper. And as the pro project progresses, they will be incorporated into the system to help researchers select which newspaper titles they should use. And then um, if we've got the underlying data, how do we transfer it in a secure way? So for example, this one is 1950. 
So this um, newspaper and this was being transferred to our data scientists. 1950 is a very good year because it's one of the later digitizations of the newspapers, but it has a lot of image because the data scientists wanted to work with the images. So um, um, the KBR Royal Library of Belgium set up this secure data send service. So some of you may know we transfer or something, but this is when we can able to transfer the files securely to researchers in the university and we know where the files have been transferred to and we've also got a record because there has to be agreement signed if they're using in copyright newspapers for example and speaking about data science I am um, I said this is an interdisciplinary project with cultural heritage professionals digital humanists but we're also working with data scientists who are doing a lot about, um, for example, document analysis. So here are colleagues um, from ID Lab, which is the um, uh, data science lab at Ghent University. We're taking the images and we're doing a number of processing steps, such as article segmentation, OCR, uh, optical character recognition, they were doing clustering and similarity analysis and linking to external knowledge sources such as Wikidata. And I will explain that in a little bit more detail. So for example, if we're taking about the literary studies um, use case, we have uh, at the bottom a third of the newspaper, we want to try and use data science techniques to try and extract these parts of the newspapers that our literary scholars are particularly interested in. So how did we do that? Um, luckily, these literary supplements are a combination of distinct visual and textual features. So as you can see here, they're at the bottom third of the page, and that is often the case. They often extend to the full breadth of the page, and they have distinct titles, um, such as feuilleton, uh, or I think I forgot the Dutch word for it as well, but means literary supplement. And at the end, it says they have to be continued. So our data scientists were able to train models to look at both the visual aspects of that and pick out some of the various different textual features in order to automatically extract the corpus. And just to give you some, and I can put this into the chat afterwards, this is a sort of an overview they created um, and what they're calling newspaper with AI in their demonstrator, where they've been able to show some of the models they've been training. So for example, here we have um, the article segmentation. So I don't know if you can see the uh, various different colors, but here they have first recognized the, the um, uh, different um, breaks in the text um, between the articles. They've recognized the titles, which of the text blocks um, connect to the titles, and which of the images connect to the titles. And this has all been done automatically. Second, um, they've been doing named entity recognition and then linking. So for example, they've done named entity extraction. Here you can see Paul Henri Spark, which I think he was one of the former, he was a Belgian socialist um, uh, politician. And then they found his name in the newspaper articles and linked through, for example, to the Wikipedia article on that um, person. Um, and uh, sec uh, thirdly, um, image similarity. So what they've been doing is extracting the images. And here you can see some cyclists from the Tour de France. And here they have recognized the images firstly, and then looked at similarity of the images. So here you can see, and um, this was from the Tour de France, and then they could find other images of cyclists as well. And interestingly, you can see this is automatically generated. You can see this group of women in some sort of um, thing carriage with wheels as well, which was seen as relatively similar. And finally, um, some of you may know the NewsEye project, which is a European project. They, um, the colleagues, the digital humanities colleagues um, from the University of Innsbruck, so Sarah Oberbliecher and her colleagues have been looking at workflows 
on how to um, work with corpus building um, on digitized newspapers. So that may be an interesting article. And just last slide, um, and Nadezhda was uh, one of the participants in this workshop, which was really great. Um, at the uh, European Association for Digital Humanities, we had a workshop where we dealt with Jewish notebooks and collections as data. So we're just preparing that, but um, there is already a notebooks page. Um, and then we'll prepare the video and the slides of that workshop later that took place in September. But I thought I would include it because there's some Russian language examples in this notebook. So I'll put those um, uh, links in the, in the chat after the presentation, along with the slides. So thank you very much for your attention. Um, uh, yeah, thank you, Spasiba. And uh, yeah, thank you for listening. Thank you so much. The talk is just fantastic. And the project, uh, something really amazing. Um, and we have some time for questions. So, um, dear participants who would like to ask the question to Sally, um, do you know, um, always we are thinking in terms of uh, the great need uh, for digital material to be uh, opened and these uh, principles of fair data. Um, as for me, it's very important to talk about uh, reusability and when you think about the possible scenarios, how to reuse this bunch of data. Sometimes it's not so obvious. Sometimes it's obvious in terms of research because researcher knows very well what do he want or he or she. Uh, so what's your opinion on that? Yes, that's a very good question. And we've been thinking a lot about that. So some of the libraries have been creating these sort of library driven corpora. Um, and some of them, I remember asking one of the digital humanities researchers and they said, oh, that's very dangerous. You can't allow librarians to uh, shape our corpus. I think how we've taken to that is, so for example, if we take the literary supplements, um, we've put a lot of effort to extract them and our literary scholar may be interested in looking at language change in literature. But if we make that corpus available, we say actually how we made it, have the transparency of the documentation, make it also citable um, with a DOI and so it can be reused, then it could be that this kind of literary supplements, which may not be of interest to every literary scholar, and but somebody else could come and look at that corpus with different literary questions or even other, not even literary questions, some other kind of questions at that corpus. So at least if we make them available, make it transparent how we made those collections um, and then say, please, if, if our rights, because that is another thing, some of these are in copyright, um, we will have a platform at the end of the project um, where we will publish these data sets with DOIs um, so they can be made available and then we will see. We can promote them at workshops and hackathons about it. Um, but yeah, reuse, um, making them in the first place and being able to make it in a, in a uh, easy way is one thing, but the reuse, yeah, we'll have to see. We will publish them and I will put into the chat in a minute the, the National Library of Scotland's Data Foundry They've got a lot in there where you can cite the data set. They've got snippets of the data. Um, so I'd be interested to ask that question to them, for example. Thank you for that question. Thank you. And only comment. Uh, all the, every single fund asks us to explain why do we need this digitization at all and what the impact of this digitized material will be. So we have to keep it in mind, uh, applying for any sort of projects. Exactly. Okay. Um, if I could just respond on that very briefly, it was amazing. Last week we had a project defense and they say, oh, why, why would anybody be interested in this? Which was a complete shock to me. Um, I thought it was obvious why people would be interested in digitized newspapers, but the, the, the evaluator said, is there actually demand for this, um, which I thought was interesting. So absolutely agree with you. 
Okay, thank you so much. Uh, and I think we have to move, unfortunately. Uh, talk to you, it's just really interesting. Uh, and thank you very much for being very active, asking the questions, just to make uh, the atmosphere so vibrant. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, so um, now we can move, I think, to the next, our uh, guest, um, and to the presentation by Goran Djurjevic. Uh, I'm sorry if uh, for mispronunciation of your second name, uh, please correct me, uh, who's an associate professor in Beijing University of uh, Foreign Research uh, in Beijing, China, uh, and <clears throat> he will uh, present uh, the make the presentation along with his colleagues, uh, co-authors. Um, and the title is uh, Mirror Studies and Sharing Knowledge, Case Study Workshop Symbols and Mirrors for Secondary School Students. So Goran, uh, the floor is yours. Oh, th thank you. Uh, thank you for this opportunity. I hope that you can uh, hear me and hopefully you can see my screen. Yeah, we can hear and see perfectly. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, thanks again for this opportunity. I'm actually just one of the person, but I, I'm pretty uh, lucky that I have presented in front of this uh, interesting uh, conference and in front of my group of colleagues who are from China, US, Croatia, and North Macedonia. Our topic is related to sharing knowledge and the mirror studies. And today I will discuss just, just one part of this uh, case study of workshop symbols and mirrors for secondary school students. The core idea is actually to connect digital materials, big data and analog uh, traditional materials within the educational system. So for introduction, I just want to, uh, to, to share some few words about our project mirror studies. This is our website and about uh, idea of sharing knowledge and knowledge management circle and about the workshop. Uh, as you can see uh, here, this is a project dedicated to mirrors, objects related to reflection. And uh, we started in 2019. And actually it was a student project. We started as a PhD and master's student. Now it grows a little bit more. And we try to uh, prevent and collect digital heritage it is based on the various aspects of the mirrors from the various world cultures, civilizations, and political entities. Uh, mirror database. Oh. Okay. I'm sorry. Archaeological sites. No, so, uh, can you hear me? Yes, very well. Yeah. Hello? We can hear sorry. you. Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, as because, long as the audio as well. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, because I I uh, actually record my presentation in case that there was some problem, but I, I will oh, just I <laughs> try, try to stop this. Uh, okay, so uh, the mirror database is actually based mostly for archaeology, and it is uh, de defined by uh, defined and divided by different archaeological cultures, including Chinese, Roman, Greeks, Egyptian. Uh, sites plus mirrors in the museums and it looks like this on the GIS map then we have this database uh, so it is related to the site city province country period context including different contexts like tombs settlements sanctuaries etc and then geographical data and when the user click on certain it actually it will be like this so it is related what is the context the country, the period, and the, the period and the different types of archaeological data are different by signs, as you can see. So all the Roman sites, for example, share, share the same color, but different signs. So it's very useful to compare if you want to research tombs or if you want to research settlements, or if you just want to research Roman or some other types of materials. So this is ju just one part of our database. We have museums as well, and we have historical sources and the scholars. The database is, the database is of course, building, and this is the big data project. But what we use and uh, why we try to connect this, we uh, use the knowledge sharing model. And as we can see through the old theorists from the knowledge sharing, the first part is uh, getting or creation of knowledge. Then 
using actually and then learning or compilation or storing the knowledge and in the fourth phase you have distribution and transformation of knowledge and finally we have the presentation so when we speak about the macro level of mirror studies we actually firstly explore the various data records books articles catalogs and other sources from the various academic fields to collect the mirrors then we create a big data collection building web, applic web application by uh, ArcGIS and then we have open access so it's easy to share and distribute and we update regularly databases one of the part for updating is user participation we have on our website some uh, co contact links and, and other data and documents that users can actually just send it to us or their own mirrors and uh, in their own collections but how we will transfer it into uh, micro level for the workshop for the students the first of all we need to select the certain artifacts and sources that should be created uh, around some story and then we could have some workshop for secondary schools which include sharing and sp spreading these workshops into the schools for teachers and students then organization of workshops and feedbacks unfortunately we didn't have these last two parts organizations and feedbacks due because of the new situation of corona and it's not so easy to organize workshops and unfortunately we didn't have uh, feedbacks for the students how it was organized and created so we have the pre-activity and the students will have something about the the activity the activity is actually divided in two parts one group of students are objects another one are visitors it's really based on the live library which is created for the humans but we create the students who will present mirrors actually and then they have during activity and after activity some tasks that they need to do and after they have discussion for the whole group one example for this is actually the text that we will we prepare for the students this is about the french mirror in the hall of mirrors in the palace of versailles and it is created the whole story how the mirror started in the french production in the 17th century and what what happened to these uh, agents and the persons who who started and we have uh, for the students this image of this mirror so image could be produced on the screen on their uh, cell phones or computers or could be uh, printed uh, the plan is for next step to have uh, the 3d model of the location or of the certain object so this is one of the uh, we can say historical mirrors located on some side another example is related to hand mirror uh, from new zealand and actually uh, we have the story uh, which has been interpreted by mirror not by humans so which is also interesting how the mirrors could have the the story interpreted and also we have this kind of uh, image related to this so as you can see the images of an artifacts are real historical and the stories are partly historical partly uh, fiction uh, we use the real data of course but we maybe recreate them in the little different way uh, for to be more interesting and more uh, useful for the students in the secondary school so I, as we speak in the schedule of workshop we can start from this introduction parts about the mirror mirror studies and the live library method then we have reading tasks and materials like preparation then we have this object library what we call this key uh, part with walking conversation then we have reflection part like answering the question and summary and finally conclusion so uh, it could be very useful for various subjects including history and world history literature social political sciences art heritage studies or some other subject because the the students will, will learn the various skills including oral presentation including acting but also including the heritage impo importance of heritage studies and recreating the knowledge from heritage so if we put it together uh, macro and micro level we have the firstly various sources then we create the knowledge then from big data collection we select certain materials for creation of workshops and then from web application we create sharing and spreading and then we have uh, users and organizations of workshops who can actually contribute and give us a feedback or update our information so for conclusion 
for this. It is for us very important as dissemination of knowledge, particularly in the context of digital humanities and our digital humanities project and big data project related to visualization of mirrors and digital protection of heritage, but also promotion of mirror studies. It's pretty new field and also a kind of uh, life library and uh, heritage studies, which could be interesting as a method for, for recreating other heritage, not just mirrors, but even other architectural or historical heritage that have in their communities or in their cities and places. And we think that this method could be interesting and useful and that we actually can manage these cycles of sharing knowledge and promotion of mirror studies for us. Uh, thank you for your attention. Feel free to contact us. I will put the, our email in the chat and also I will put our link to our website in the chat and feel free to ask the questions and comment. Thank you. Thank you very much, Goran. This is a very interesting project and a really interesting idea. And I think that uh, the colleagues will agree fully uh, with that. I can see that, um, yeah, applause is uh, from Sally. Uh, are there any questions? Yeah, please, Sally. Thank you very much indeed, Goran. Uh, this is this is a fa fascinating area, and I just was wondering, in where do mirrors fit um, in? Um, I don't know how to even put it iconogra iconography or something like this. I was just wondering whether, in sort of classification of artworks and this kind of other, um, let's say, artistic objects, whether there has been a space already for mirrors I mean you've got all the time I mean I'm not an art historian so forgive me for uh, this but I just wondered if in kind of controlled vocabularies that exist in in, in, in now um, are there spaces for mirrors already or is this a new because it's an emerging field um, is this something that needs to be added in um, to existing control vocabularies? And if so, what do you think about that? If that made it? Okay, sure. Yeah, uh, so the first of all, uh, well, uh, for, for our perspective, mirror studies are new field. It's pretty new because we are not considering uh, them just an art objects. Of course, we can classify them according to the regional production centers or some certain civilization, political entity, or we can uh, about the diff different places. But for us, mirrors have much more uh, idea because we, we can even use them in the chemistry or physics because mirrors are related to the optics, this analysis of materials, or also mirrors are important for psychology and psychoanalysis, which could be related to our identity or our uh, self perspective then we, we can open the idea of social identities and parts of group and self-reflections and group reflections, collective reflections, which make it much broader. Plus, we have mirrors as a strong political objects because those decorations on the mirrors, which are usually, or even those uh, mirror in Versailles have been used as a political project, not just for decoration of the Versailles, but actually as a power of uh, early modern France to be more powerful than Venice and their uh, arc rivals. So it is also important to understand, and we, we just want to create them because mirrors are not ordinary objects, although, although it maybe looks ordinary. They are pretty interesting and not like pottery or something else. But in another hand, just to uh, open the space for other, this kind of heritage and objects to, to use it in the, in the school system. I hope that I was clear. Yes, no, definitely. You've you've opened up my uh, narrow thinking of, uh, of of mirror studies in its broader context, and that's fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and uh, I completely forgot to mention that uh, we are streaming uh, to the um, YouTube channel uh, of Perm University, and the audience much broader. So there is a question uh, here. So. Um, as far as I understand, there are several steps. Uh, what about uh, the evaluation of the final step? How to understand that it was successful? Yes, of, 
of, of course, we'll prepare some uh, evaluation forms and materials for the teachers and for the students, and they can use some kind of questionnaire and survey to see about this. This is one way. Another way is their introspection to the, during the discussion and understanding. But unfortunately, we didn't get this step <laughs> during the COVID era. So we, after COVID, we are planning actually to implement it in the school system. And we, we, we need to see there are some other issues, for example, about the years and ages and different school system in different parts of the world. Plus, of course, language issues, because workshop is now in English. We'll try to translate it in the various languages and in Russian as well. This is one of the goals to translate it in Russian. And so if we have it more languages, then it could be more useful for the for the schools and for the teachers, because we are pretty realistic about this. In some countries, it's not so easy to uh, read and learn during the non-native language materials. Okay, I see. I see. Thank you so much. Do we have any other question? We have a couple of minutes. Maybe any commentaries? Oh, me or someone else? Someone else. Maybe um, <laughs> someone. You, can, you, you can. You Maybe you can take a, a minute for a final comment. Maybe clarify something. Yeah, actually, I, I can. I can use the floor to call people to be a mirror studies conference. So if they are interested in the mirrors in the various way and digital humanities and other aspects, they can visit our website and, or send an email and we are looking forward. So small advertisement. <laughs> Thank you. Um, is this uh, a link, uh, mirrorstudies.com, uh, to yes. know more about the conference? Okay, thank you so and, much. And, yeah. and the whole project, yes, the whole project. Okay, thank you so much. It was just great presentation. Uh, thank you thank again. You. Uh, it was just great to know uh, about this sort of uh, new field emerged uh, and uh, now uh, let me uh, it in introduce myself to you so <laughs> um, and uh, right now i will share uh, you uh, my screen uh, and start a talk about virtual museums uh, and uh, i'd like to talk today about uh, origin of virtual museums just a second Here we are. So um, the origin of virtual museums uh, in modern literature is not often associated with the development of the World Wide Web. Uh, so um, it's often associated, but uh, not, not often relates to the previous uh, decades uh, from the emerging of uh, World Wide Web. Um, and relates to emergence of uh, museums online. Uh, only a few researchers trace the early history of virtual museums, uh, which not related to uh, this World Wide Web. And for example, Erki uh, Huchtamo sees the origin of virtual museums in the emergence of an individualized experience uh, of visitors in a real museum. Uh, and opportunities for the personalized trajectories moving through the museum and increasing of interactivity there. Chronologically, the author uh, traces these uh, processes since um, 1920s uh, with challenges related to the exhibition design, which implement more and more interactive elements, such as uh, loopholes, for example, for seeing through them. Uh, for the performances uh, or uh, seeing more about um, exhibited objects uh, to be more focused on something. However, it's necessary to pay attention to the fact that uh, from our perspective, the concept of the virtual museum began to take shape earlier and it was associated with the expansion of museum functions, the increasing openness of museum to society the desire of museums to become closer to uh, visitors uh, in different way, in different ways. So, um, a modern virtual museum can be understood as an information system containing a conceptually unified electronic collection or a set of collections of objects, items with metadata which has the characteristics uh, of a museum and provides research, educational and other activities in the virtual space. Um, however, it should be noted that the concept of a virtual museum has gone through a long stage of evolution 
in this path to the current state. The emergence uh, of the concept of a virtual museum as a kind of a museum extension is closely related to uh, the expansion of the public significance of the museum as a cultural institution. Uh, and the virtual museum as a concept was born with the understanding that the museums should be open to the society and move beyond uh, their borders. Oops. Some secrets. <laughs> um, the mass media of the second half of 19th century uh, actively published materials prepared by the museums. In such newspaper publications, not only advertisements that invite public to the museum are often found, but also very interesting articles uh, which became more uh, beautiful and engaging for readers with the um, invention of illustrative material, including uh, using pictures, uh, photos, uh, scratches, etc. Museum storytelling appears on the pages of the newspaper articles illustrated with examples of museum exhibits. Uh, the uh, era of cinema uh, brought a great tool for the visualization of the context of, of the museum exhibits. Uh, it was a technological alternative for the re recontextualization of the museum objects for a better understanding of the natural environment and the ways the object could be utilized. One of the earliest examples uh, of the placing an object in a context or uh, rather even a reconstruction of this environment of an object was a film made by the Museum of Natural History in New York uh, and dedicated to dinosaurs. Uh, so it was the way to revive the remains on the screen. Uh, radio and television uh, in a similar way served to inform about the activities of museums, revealed museum secrets uh, and maintained the curiosity of wider audiences, of listeners and viewers. The electronic archive of the BBC, uh, the project you know, very famous one, contains unique materials that have been broadcast on radio and then on television since uh, 1920. According to the Radio Times magazine uh, program, the radio programs recorded uh, with the participation of the museums uh, were quite varied uh, and appeared regularly uh, on the um, radio casting. Uh, the um, <clears throat> television programs about museums and museum collections, which have become regular since the 50s, have already been designed for different categories of viewers, including school children uh, of different ages. And television and radio broadcasting laid the foundation for the remote development of content created by and with the participation of museums. Unfortunately, uh, we are very limited in our opportunities to know much, uh, to, to know more uh, about these um, records from early 50s and then because of uh, legal restrictions by uh, national archives in Great Britain. But I think that uh, this project has all the chances to be promoted and they can obtain some more uh, information from the local um, archives. Um, uh, the digital tour uh, to the museum started in the 50s. Uh, the process of inventing a virtual museum uh, consisted of two main directions related to the technologies and the concept in general. The technological component was associated with experiments with new technologies and their application to the museums. There were many interesting discoveries and findings on this way, and I would like to say about some of them uh, briefly. Already in the 60s, there could have been a digital revolution in museums associated with the development of the famous Plato platform at the University of Illinois. In 1968, at the conference in Metropolitan Museum of Art, uh, a very famous conference which launched uh, multiple uh, activities by the museum related to information technology, uh, and it was held uh, under support by uh, IBM. And Donald Bitzer presented the scenario for using this platform by the museums in educational activities. 
But in this case, the plateau for the museums was not has been accepted. And most likely the proposed innovations were too advanced for that time to be easily accepted by the museums. And uh, some ideas were, for, were, were so advanced and they forecasting our current uh, stage. So it was forecasting through a half of a century, which is absolutely great. Uh, the next stage, uh, in the development uh, of a concept of a virtual museum is associated with the museum multimedia. Uh, significant contribution to its development were made by Nicholas Ponte and Steve Ghana, uh, who worked on the very possibility of providing the interactive nature of multimedia content in the uh, 1970s and 80s. In addition, the replicability <clears throat> and low cost of uh, compact, disc, uh, compact discs uh, ensured uh, the availability of museum content and its uh, wide distribution. Um, one of the uh, best examples of uh, museum multimedia was the CD treasures of the Smithsonian, uh, which received the um, user word in 1991 uh, from the American Museum Association. Now it's American Museum Alliance. Um, in NGO, which is very famous uh, and very impactful. Experiments with uh, multimedia and alternative ways of presenting museum collections created a new space different from the physical museum. It became possible for the viewer to interact with reproduced museum objects and choose the order to move through all the materials. And right now we can uh, experience the same uh, in 30 years. Uh, of this experimenting in the museums. Uh, the formation of the modern virtual museum has become possible thanks to the development of web technologies. The first museum uh, sites uh, were significantly inferior to multimedia disc in terms of their capabilities, graphics, uh, interactivity. It was necessary to significantly adapt the previous approaches and develop new ones for the effective use of the online space. Modern solutions based on information systems were formed through a long evolution of the very uh, concept of a virtual museum uh, in aggregating the idea of remote use of the museum content, expanding the functions of the museum and technological, uh, technological uh, innovation of this time. And I would like to conclude with the uh, project uh, I started uh, in uh, the Center for Contemporary and Digital History in Luxembourg, uh, in the University of Luxembourg, uh, a couple of years ago. And um, this uh, project uh, on digital history of virtual museums includes um, quite more information about pre online history of development of virtual museum as a concept. And here you can see uh, some more interesting examples uh, on this way. Uh, and I would like to conclude uh, with an idea that uh, virtual museums, uh, what we have now, uh, just passed a long way through transformation and digital technology uh, was uh, main, but not the only one uh, thing uh, on this, uh, on this uh, evolution. And uh, thank you so much for your attention. I, I think uh, if you have any question, I will be happy to answer them. Uh, thank you so much, Sally, for your interest. And to give somebody else the floor first before I... And on the hand is your no, great. No, thank you. This this is this is fascinating, and it made me think of two things. So, well, a number of many things actually. Firstly, um, in the library world, um, we went. I mean, it was nice that you went back to the nineteen twenties and sort of situated things from there. In in the um, <clears throat> sorry, two seconds. In, in the library world, um, around the 1990s, we 
so a lot later than you were saying for the museums, we started something called um, libraries beyond the walls or be without walls. And then we had a whole phase of doing hybrid libraries that was really popular sort of the mid nineties. Uh, yeah, probably the mid nineties. And I just wondered because you've gone from completely to virtual um, if there was ever the concept of a hybrid museum or something, that space in between. But again, it was libraries. It started with the libraries out without walls. So going beyond the museum or going beyond the library building, like you were saying. So I just wondered if if that had been a concept within museums or museum studies and uh, just as a comparison. I think that uh, this, this idea just moved from the... Um, museum environment to the other environments because of uh, ideas of Andre Malraux from 50s uh, and his books uh, related to museum without walls, uh, which became classical ones uh, in understanding the museum functions beyond the museum walls, which is great. But I would like to also emphasize that it was uneasy to invent the term virtual museum uh, because there were several of them. And uh, right now we use digital museum, museum on the web, uh, we, we use electronic museum, we use some other things uh, which are pretty much the same. Uh, but uh, I investigated the uh, way how the term virtual museum appeared. Um, can you guess what? Uh, we use this, we human beings use this term virtual museum in 19th century. I found several nice, really nice samples uh, of using this uh, term virtual museums uh, in 19th century, in, in early 20th century. We had no idea about uh, virtual uh, in uh, current uh, sense related to digital world. Uh, but uh, there are several meanings. The first one, uh, it was very important. Uh, virtual museums, uh, it was the real place, uh, but it was not legal to call this place the museum, but it, it can be a room uh, of a famous person with his, um, I don't know, different um, uh, artifacts of his life, these sort of things, but it's not was, it was not a museum itself, but it was looked like a museum. Uh, another thing uh, relates to education. Uh, for instance, um, uh, I found the uh, mentioning uh, of pottery, uh, a cup, uh, can be a uh, virtual museum in that sense for a uh, technological museum uh, of pottery, for instance, in, the, in this case. Uh, and also uh, virtual museums, uh, as we call them today, uh, had the chance to be called uh, imaginary museums because, um, because of this concept, uh, they were in a con in concurrent environment, both of these terms. And at that point, uh, at some point, uh, the futurists accepted this uh, imaginary museums. It was a revolution in understanding of museums. Uh, and they uh, wanted to uh, make some sort of new art uh, related to um, not the museum in, in general, but something. And they started to create museums of ideas in this sort of uh, very brave uh, ideas and very smart and bold ones, I, would, I must admit. Uh, but at, at some point, uh, they, uh, these terms uh, had the same meaning. And at the cross border, uh, they, uh, the virtual museum started to, uh, de to be developed in terms of uh, museum uh, extension. And imaginary museum, it's more about our fantasies, uh, about our ideas, but not about the reality, which is uh, funny. Uh, and uh, the third idea to mention in relation to the hybrid uh, library and museums is about inventing the terms. Um, I have a little collection uh, of uh, snapshots from uh, early um, museums online. Uh, and. Uh, this, this idea to um, highlight the invention, uh, innovation, uh, new environment. And we have so many funny uh, ideas how to call this new, uh, what is it, in information resource. It's not a virtual museum, what it can be, it can be a museum on the web. And there is a plain text <laughs> related to some explanation about the exposition. Uh, 
and even textual um, descriptions of some photos <laughs> without any pictures on it, which is um, a nice example of early ages of museums on the web. Fantastic. Thanks Thank you. So, Thank you so much. And just to, just to respond briefly, I'm sure you know this PhD thesis, but from um, uh, Rebecca Khan, um, she's got a small chapter where she's looking at the British Museum's online presence. So if it's in a bigger thesis, so it may be interesting. And exactly the imaginary library that 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 exists as well. And I think that's very interesting. And just last comment, uh, which I, ah yeah, that was it. Your um, uh, Smithsonian on CD, that made me think of when I was a student in the early 90s, this, we had Shakespeare on CD, I was in the UK then, and I, I like to think of that as the first digital humanities, we were doing that then, when we were delivered those texts on CD-ROM, so it made me think of that, so thanks, thanks very much indeed, uh, uh, Nadezhda. I have bought this, uh, this CD, uh, this Smithsonian treasures. And the funny thing is it was a great challenge to find the appropriate computer to replay it because of they are not uh, compatible with it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it was a great challenge, but uh, some schools <laughs> in Russian Federation are not so innovative yet. Uh, and some pretty old computer and my friend helped me to replay it. And it was just fantastic something to, you know, just, 30 years back, way back machine. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? We have two minutes till the end of our uh, session. Uh, just a little comment. Um, I haven't published a lot on, this, um, on these ideas uh, on virtual museology and prehistory and this, this sort of things. Uh, and I hope to have a book at some point uh, to, to clarify the things in more details. Um, and uh, I'm happy to share these uh, ideas with you uh, to know feedback, uh, maybe in some more details. Okay, as soon as we have no questions, thank you, Goran. <laughs> uh, if you have any comments, uh, the floor is yours. Or maybe it's just applauses. Uh, okay, uh, dear speakers, dear guests, uh, thank you very much for uh, being with us all this day. Um, and this was uh, the first day of the conference. Uh, tomorrow and after tomorrow, we have sessions uh, in Russian. Uh, but um, anyway, uh, if you want to improve your Russian, you're very welcome tomorrow. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> soon we expect. Uh, having our uh, proceedings uh, of the conference. So we will stay in touch. And thank you very much for the very fruitful conversation you made this day. Absolutely. Thank you.